I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. All right, fellas, here we go. For those watching uh, on the video, we've got this immense infinity quantum block from Leela here. Let's start off, uh, Philip, by just explaining to the people that can see. And for those that can't, we're looking at like almost like 18 by 18 or something, massive Leela block. Good guess, yeah. It's, in this case, it's 16 by 16 by 16. So really okay. good guess indeed. It's pretty big. And uh, should I say what it is? What yeah, it does? sure. I mean, you know, as much as you want to say. I just know that anyone who's, I mean, most people listen, but for the people watching, if they're like, uh, what's the elephant in the room? <laughs> <laughs> the golden elephant. Yeah. Yeah, so the plates are charged with pure quantum energy and it's we've further advanced and advanced and advanced the technology now this is extremely strong so on the hawkins scale this goes up to 2000 on the hawkins scale uh, but it can level it down to anyone in the room that may not be able to take in such levels because you know they're not used to it from the nervous system or because they have so much many toxins in the body that they would just start sweating and and detoxing so it, it would um, scale it down for these people but it doesn't do that then for everyone in the room really it, it goes to everyone um, to exactly the level they need so almost to the perfect level that you need in each moment which is pretty fascinating it's it's really a new development in that case and the size is because people requested literally people out of our community kept asking for a whole year they wanted a block of this size we did a big poll and they said, this is what it needs to be because they want to charge their salad bowls. You know, Ian charges his coffee there. It's yes. small, but if you have a salad bowl, a whole plate or... You put a whole <laughs> pot of coffee <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you have a barbecue, you know, put your meat in there and it's, it's no issue. And then some people, well, we have a couple others that have this here, not, not of this strength, but they lay in it literally. You know, you know, I'm going to do that. The first thought I had, <laughs> <laughs> the first thought I had, because I've put, put crammed my head inside the, the. I think we've all done that. The, the quantum and the infinity blocks. Uh, but my first thought was, this is going to be the dog and cat's new little healing portal. If I can put something in there to um, incentivize them to to lie down. <laughs> The oh, they'll find their way to it. I, I can they will? attest to that. Yeah, cats and dogs do that all the time. Yeah. Are you a proud cat owner? Uh, yeah, yeah, my Schrodinger's cat, yes. Is is the box thing universal with cats? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. anytime we get a delivery... Best Christmas ever. It's, it's the tape, though. Uh, our cat, Jelly, is obsessed with eating the tape, with packing tape. And only, <laughs> and only packing tape. And... <laughs> To the point where in the past, before he was our cat and he was just Allison's cat, he would get, um, he would eat a bunch and have all these digestive issues and it would make him sick. And Jelly's then, a tape connoisseur. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, only yeah, packing Yeah, so tape. anytime a delivery comes, and there's a lot of deliveries coming since we recently moved in, it's like, Allison's like, put it away, put it away. So I have special hiding spots for any boxes with tape on them because he will find them and eat it. Yeah, no, Schrodinger nailed it actually using, using a box as a reference <laughs> because cats do in fact love boxes. Like if you leave a box out, a cat will find its way inside the box regardless of how high you place it. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm glad that's not just our cat. I feel like he's, he's more normal now. Uh, Ian, how did you get connected with Philip and the Leela quantum, quantum upgrade world? If I'm not mistaken, I think you're the one that told me about it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, I it's been a few years now. So. Yeah, it's probably been like three or four years. And I think that was, if I recall, the reason that I gave it my initial um, <laughs> yeah, curiosity. Because you asked me if it was legit or not. Yeah, yeah because there's a, and we're going to talk about this, I'm sure, and we have on our past podcast with Philip. But I mean, it's probably been 20 years. People have been coming up with these little quantum necklaces and stickers. Mm -hmm. And I think by the very nature nature of quantum energy, it's easy for misguided or in some cases unscrupulous people to claim that something is that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, you lending some, some validity to it definitely had weight for me because I know you're a pragmatic, 
science-minded person. And yeah, I was like, there's, well, there's and I know you're honest yeah. also. So you're honest, you have integrity, <laughs> and you're competent about these things. But I don't think I ever learned like how did you guys first meet and how did you actually become I, aware? Interestingly enough, I got a phone call from Philip about four or five years ago when I literally was in Santa Fe. And I was walking, which is you know where you now live, or right outside of there, and uh, it just kind of it was a funny occurrence. But I, I got this phone call, and you had you had reached out to me about carbon sixty, and you were looking at doing some things with carbon sixty, and you had already done some research on it, and so that's where the the initial conversation started. And then <clears throat> we started talking more and more, and then as you were developing Leela, um, initially you had worked with a group. Uh, 9010, way back when, that was doing quantum behavior and, and kind of manipulations of thereof. And then you started Leela and really kind of took it to the next level. And the thing that really was great to me is the science behind it, because everything has been rigorously tested. And it's we were joking before the podcast, uh, I've been doing testing at, at a university on the new quantum upgrade. And, I, you know, it's all double blinded stuff. And I've got, you know, the a, biochemistry professor assessing everything and nobody knows except you know myself who has the notes on what's what and the results are consistent they're repeatable and it's it's remarkable i mean it's just you know that's that's the thing that gets me about it is <clears throat> even though i know what's going on it's still so far ahead of where we really are you know we can't actually directly measure what is shifting on the, on the quantum behavior, but we can actually see the, the secondary, tertiary, quaternary effects of it and say like, yeah, 100% of the time this is working. And the thing that really intrigued me when I started working with Philip on Leela and why I wanted to do you know, the advisory role for the science was everything was being vetted, tested, double-blind studies. It was done the right way. And so I could actually hang my hat on it and say, yes, if you do this, it's not some frou frou concept. We can show you images of your, you know, dark field microscopy shots of your blood and say your blood is going to change. The quality of your life is going to be enhanced. And it was just the efficacy. It was, you know, kind of off the charts. And that that's I mean, ultimately that's what you want. You don't necessarily have to understand how the technology is working down to the nuts and bolts of it. Most people who get on a jet cannot describe the inner workings of all the circuitry <laughs> in the cockpit, but the, you don't need to. You know, you need to know that if I do this thing, it's going to benefit me biologically. And so, you know, and it's just been, we've kind of just developed the relationship over the past four or five years and kind of used it as an opportunity to, from my perspective, push not just the, the kind of the esoteric components of it from the, the subtle energies and things like that, but to take that and bring it into the mainstream science and say, okay, how is this functioning? What is it doing? How can we test it? Because we've been doing wound healing experiments as of late, you know, trying to show differing rates in the, the, uh, the progression of tissue tissues. Um, and then a lot of experiments on showing ATP levels, which is, and we'll talk about that later because those still blow me away. I, I mean, again, I'm the guy doing the experiments and it's, it's double blinded. And I, it's just kind of hard to wrap your brain around that remotely 10,000 miles away, you can do something in a lab that is going to a hundred percent of the time change the outcomes and just you know i mean you don't generally see something that has that kind of efficacy where it's it's a hundred percent of the time it's it's bizarre yeah yeah we try to get that with uh pharmaceuticals <laughs> yeah good luck <laughs> <laughs> anyway i don't want to throw a negative spin on the conversation this early um so philip you know, people that have listened to the show will know you from your prior appearances where we were talking about, um, you know, what we have here, part of the Leela Quantum suite of products. And then a few months ago, you reached out and said, hey, we've got this new thing called Quantum Upgrade, which is, a, I guess, a subsidiary of, of your mother company, could you say? Sister. Sister yeah. company, okay. And you're like, now we've figured out a way to use this quantum energy that's been so effective with uh, the Leela physical products. Now we've developed a way to do it without having the physical product in your house, um, which is intriguing to me. And so I got the service and I've been trying it out. And I actually had, and we can talk about this in a bit, I had a booster set for 1 p.m. today when we were going to start the interview. <laughs> and then flights got delayed and stuff. So, you know, the house probably felt great at 1, um, but I don't know where we are now. 1.30, so maybe, I don't know if it's still on and how long it lasts, but... Uh, you know, I've been playing around with it with the different boosters. And I mean, I love this kind of stuff. So, oh my God, these S's. <laughs> <laughs> 
Suffering I, succotash. I, I will have already <laughs> um, explained this in the intro, but uh, yeah, I'm having a very hard time with S's because I have fake plastic teeth in my head at the moment. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to <laughs> practice. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's funny. Um, so I guess my question to you is this. Um, at what point did you realize that you could start to use the methods with which you've infused physical objects with quantum energy to be able to transmit them non-locally based on these unique identifiers, such as your car, your pet, your house, even you. What was the, um, the transition there, the discovery moment for you guys to be able to do it? Yeah, so that already happened years ago, frankly, when we developed the first blocks. Relatively early on, we already knew we could... Um, actually really apply quantum entanglement, right? I mean, the 2022 Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded for research on quantum entanglement. But the, all that is, it doesn't interest me a, a bit. Actually, I think it's cool that it comes into the mainstream and people hear about it, but there's really nothing behind it. We actually apply it. Like you can literally test it um, because even with a block like that, you can take a picture of yourself and put it in. And you're in the field and you can go to town while you're in the field. So that is the first where we knew that there's quantum <coughs> entanglement. We did experiments like that. And people apply that at home, right? They have an ant that doesn't feel good and they put the, the picture in. However, there's limitations with a regular block because you have a block usually at a specific level. Let's say it's at 700 on the Hawkins scale or 900 on the Hawkins scale. And then that's the level you have. You put the picture in. And that's that. And also, you couldn't put more than one picture inside because you would commingle the energies. And so, we always work with the highest integrity because this is powerful stuff. You know, some people may still think it's woo woo, but it's really powerful stuff. But it, it has to be handled with the highest level of integrity. Um, and we could not offer something where suddenly people's energies get commingled or you put an elephant in the zoo in there and a cat and then a guy and a girl and whatever and then you commingle these energies. It's just not, you can't operate like that. Um, and so we developed a whole new set of systems actually based on this technology where now we removed all of those limitations where we have complete flexibility in the in the Hawkins scale up to a certain level. And also we've removed the the issue with you know putting in one or two, three or a million different people. So that, that was a long development process. So that probably took us 12 months uh, in total to develop until we had that all set. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we obviously needed to develop like how do you then actually do it that someone can customize it? Because now, to explain to the people so with the service, you can book this for your home or for yourself or even for a dog or a cat. Uh, and then I think we have a car and a business. So let's say for yourself, you, you, you set it for yourself. Then you can set um, a certain Hawkins value for the daytime and for the nighttime. And then... As the company, you need to think about, okay, so but not everyone lives in the same time zone, right? So you need to fix that. And then the whole system needs to be set up the way that it, that it does that also. That, you know, you live in Austin, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It needs to recognize that and, and all that. So it, the whole development was, was a long time. Yeah, and, you know, finally we had it all finished and... Yeah, and now we can still keep developing because it, it never stops, frankly. It's not like we we don't have this now and then we just sit on our asses and <laughs> we're just letting it ride. No, it's it's like we want to continue to hear from the people. What else do they want? Oh, they want additional frequencies. So how do we how can we include frequencies that people can book certain frequencies in? Yeah, now someone can sit on the sofa at home and use their cell phone and literally say, okay. You know, I want this type of energy now for the day. And at three o'clock, I have an important meeting or I have a tennis match, whatever. I want to set my 30-minute booster to higher energy. 
and oh, and I felt a little angry lately. Maybe it's because I haven't been grateful for the things I have in my life. Maybe I book in the gratitude frequency. You can do that in almost, it's a near real time, frankly. It's within five minute lag time, our system reacts to what you put in. And it's, it's humbling, frankly, that, that that works. But then we wouldn't want to stop there, right? We needed to have the science because that, that's so important because we could tell people it works. And then you have people that see the energy and you have some people that experience the energy, right? That's great. But, you know, I think where humanity is right now, there's positive energy needed on earth, frankly. And that's, we, we see ourselves as just being helpers in whatever is being birthed, right? Where there's a lot of companies and great people around the globe, what you're doing, what you're doing, you know, everyone does their part, but that's like our part. And um, yeah, so we feel um, we, we just help with that. <laughs> well, I just learned uh, a couple important things. One is that you had this under wraps for a long time and didn't tell anyone because <laughs> if you've been working on it for that long and then you're like, hey, Luke, we have this thing. So I'm glad that you didn't just get the idea and put it out in the world without being thoughtful about it. But perhaps more importantly... Uh, when you mentioned you don't want to put two pictures inside of a Leela infinity block, uh, right now in my office, I have a picture of our dog Cookie and a picture of my mom. And as you're saying that, I'm like, is my mom going to start barking? <laughs> like, I got to fix that. I'm going to take Cookie out and leave mom in. I didn't know that. <clears throat> it's a, a nuance of that particular um, product. So it, thank you. It for will me. probably be okay, but it's it's interesting because we had um, someone report. It's actually K. L. Murr. He's he's also a biohacker and he's very active in in the in the quantum power group on Telegram. And he had forgotten his dog's hair um, or or dog's hair was in the infinity block while he had his picture there, and he literally noticed over a few days, and he didn't know that he suddenly communicated better with the dog. Like he understood suddenly when the dog was um, hungry or, or things that he wouldn't notice usually. And it was a deeper connection. And then at some point he removed the uh, the photograph of his and then saw that the dog hair was in there and then a light bulb went on. And so it's not always bad. We recommend still to not do that because you usually really commingle energies. Partners can do it, for example, if they both consent, right? So because things may come up because everyone has stuff in the relationship that may be buried, like some underlying issues that you didn't talk about, you know, and but you need to talk about it in order to resolve it, then that may bring it up. So you need to be aware of these things. You wow. know, yeah. one of one of the uh, the stranger but probably the most tangible things I've seen was uh, a friend of ours, Todd Shipman, left Sage for a day inside the block. And then he had forgotten that it was in there and then he took it out and he put milk in to charge his milk before he drank it. And when he took the milk out, it tasted like sage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there's that. that's one of the things that I find incredibly intriguing is, you know, and we did, we did an experiment with Todd on stage that we've talked about. It's up on YouTube at the 2021 Biohacking Conference where he has a horrible shellfish allergy, right? He's super allergic. So we took crab meat and opened a can and took the juice and derma rolled his arm and put the put the crab on and instantly you know like an old school dermal stamp test for histamine reactions it swelled up blew up hives on one arm and then i put it in a block and talked for maybe i don't know 2 3 minutes about waveform dynamics and what's really happening you know because there there are a whole lot of things that are actually going on that we don't normally think about everybody thinks of a wave as this but you know it's kind of this motion but it's really it's you know, spheres moving in and out with a pressure gradient, rotations and chirality. And there's a whole host of different things going on there. And the the shifts that we're kind of eliciting from changes in the quantum behavior, they cascade up from the very base levels. And that's why you can take something the, that a, a frequency that would be related to um, the taste of sage or in, in the case of Todd, you know, we negated the negative effects of the crab meat. So I took it out and derma rolled his other arm and put the, the juice on and nothing happened. And literally at the end of that, everybody in the audience walked up to look at it because, <laughs> because it was such a, you know, everyone knows that if you're allergic to something, you're going to be allergic to it three minutes later. But that's not actually the case because what you're really reacting to is 
everything that's manifest, we think think of ourselves as as a solid thing, right? And we express solidity, but really, we're a coalescing of all these vibratory things that have come together, and it's electron cloud repulsion. You know, when when I touch you, it's I'm sensing the push of my electron cloud on your electron cloud and the repulsion therein. And so, when you take something like the the crab meat you're really looking for constructive or destructive interference of a waveform because we're all just big waveforms. You know, and, and I, my particular take is that our consciousness actually expresses the waveform to coalesce in a certain way. So you express as Luke, you express as Philip, and I express as Ian, and, and we coalesce in those waveforms. So you can use something like a quantum block and actually modulate very subtle behaviors so that something that would be potentially detrimental for you, like in the case of that... Uh, shellfish allergy, it's really not because you negate the issues with destructive interference. And so the waveforms actually sync together. So it's kind of like you're sanding off the rough edges at a submolecular level. And so when you actually ingest it, then you don't have a problem. And the, those are the things that I, I find remarkable because it's, we're, we're touching on things that are the subtle essence of what we are. And it, it just you know cascades up from there. I remember uh, at that conference, the buzz about that particular <laughs> demonstration. And I was off podcasting or something as usual. So I missed all of the speakers, which I always do. Uh, but yeah, there was like these murmurs in the crowd. Did you see the thing that the Leela? Oh, you know, it was like, it was a big buzz. I think because in that world too, it's like, you know, a lot of people I think are in earnest making claims about things and and you know, describing the benefits of their products or services, but services. But uh, <laughs> I'm never going to get over this. I'm sorry, audience. I'm probably noticing it more than anyone. But um, but it's really cool when you can see, yeah, real the time. quantum realm come into the visible spectrum and go, oh wow, that arm looks like that. That one doesn't. Yeah. Um, that's that's very compelling. Now that said, let's give a disclaimer. Obviously, if you're allergic to something, maybe don't try this at home. Yeah, I mean that's what we definitely say right now. Don't try that at home. You know, it's it's too early because we need to provide more guidance. There's too many different substances out there, too many different allergies and all of that. So uh, it's really at your own risk at this point. But because we've heard it so much from so many different people about gluten sensitivity, about a person that could never eat a lemon or drink even a drop of a lemon juice now being able to do it. Talk, dairy sensitivities, talk, dairy sensitivities, yeah. all that. Now there's a clinic in, in Munich in Germany that is a pretty famous clinic there and people from London and all over Europe fly there to get treated. And one of the things is they have a $50,000 device to test for allergies. It's a medical device. And then they can test also reduction in allergy response and stress responses and stuff like that. And their pilot study, they found, and they only charged all the substances for three minutes where we told them four minutes, please, because that's what we energetically can see and observe as being the minimum you should do it if you wanted to use it for a food allergy. A 65 to 95 percent reduction in allergy response across all substances they tested, and again that was just three minutes. So we're assuming at this point this will probably be rather 70 to 100 percent in that realm. But it's the largest study that's going on right now. And before that, we tell people to not use it. And that also brings me to the point. You know, we're, we're talking about quantum upgrade, but now we have this thing here. So to not confuse people, there's obviously a big difference because the quantum upgrade is really the service. It's something you don't need a physical device. You, you Basically, you are in the field if you have it for yourself or your home is in the field and things like that. And you can customize it up and down however you want it. It's way more powerful than what a, a single block could do. Uh, in that sense, it, it goes way deeper if you have the field for you um, than, than just a block. But then there's also things you cannot do with the quantum upgrade. And that's, for example, charging this coffee, right? You could not charge the coffee. I mean, we, we could find a way, but it would be just too complicated. So you at, at home, you couldn't do that with a quantum upgrade. So if you want to deal with charging, structuring your water and things like that, you actually need a physical device. But it's interesting. We've now heard lately in the last four weeks from several people with gluten sensitivities and and allergies that if they eat that type of stuff and they set their quantum upgrade on booster that they have less issues so there's something there as <laughs> oh, well wow. again 
don't try this, yeah. but you know, maybe, you know, for example, I don't eat a lot of meat. Um, I eat, I'm like 90, 95% vegetarian, but I do eat meat. So every now and then, every two weeks, I do eat a piece of meat, you know, maybe on average. But when I do, usually I feel very heavy afterwards and there's just a lot of work to digest. So I now always set the uh, booster for the time and the booster is 30 minutes. And by the way, you can set another booster right after if you wanted to. So if, if you have a longer process to digest and that it actually helps. So it's, it's kind of cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, the thought that I had uh, speaking about the fish allergy with, with our friend uh, Todd Shipman is this block is about the size of a single uh, serving pizza. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I, I, you know, every once in a while I fall off the wagon and I think, no, I'll be fine this time. It's like years of not being fine every time I eat gluten. And I'll take charcoal and enzymes and, you know, it's like, it's a borderline <laughs> eating disorder, you know, rather than just going, I can't eat this stuff and just leaving it alone. My wife constantly is like, dude, again? I'm like, no, I think I feel pretty good. Uh, but... I don't do this at home, but I am going to put a goddamn pizza in here and I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> you can do it with sugar, by the way. And sugar is great. The clinic also tested sugar. Same results. It was a huge reduction in stress response. So you cannot be allergic to sugar, but you can have a big stress response. So if you put your, I don't know, your chocolates in there, your cookies uh, for quite some time, you can feel really good about it afterwards. Well, you know, uh, digestion has been one of my sticking points. Um, is I'm really healthy, vital, great sleep, all the things, great energy, but um, but I do struggle with digestion sometimes. So you'll see we have the um, quantum block on the kitchen island. That wasn't just to honor you when you came over. It literally stays there all the time, and it's right there because that's where our food and smoothies and stuff get set usually before we eat them. So even Allison, who's not really typically that interested in all my funny biohacking stuff in the house. She's gotten in the habit over the years of putting her stuff in there too. And I think if it's good for her, like she's very much more discerning than I am about this stuff. But we put everything in there. Coffees, yeah. smoothies, meals, supplements. I mean, it's just part of our assembly line now in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, but I do want to differentiate between, to not confuse people again, and thank you for that, the Leela, we're talking about physical blocks and we've done shows on that and people can learn more. Um, but I wanted you to weigh in I in uh, about the Hawkins scale since the quantum upgrade service is using that sort of um, model mm -hmm. in their calibrations. And if I'm not mistaken, it was a year or two ago that I said, man, you got to check out this Hawkins stuff. And it seems like since we've talked, you've really taken that teaching and run with it. <laughs> Where now you're cal like when we were out at your lab, we'll talk about that in the podcast yeah. we're going to do. But you're in the car calibrating stuff, and you're you're using muscle testing all the time. Um, so either of you really, I mean, maybe you could explain for people that haven't heard my prior podcast where I've talked about David Hawkins and the map of consciousness and all this stuff. Maybe you could break it down, yeah, and then you sure. guys can kind of talk about how and why you use that model as a metric with the quantum upgrade service. I, it's an incredibly effective and, and simple method to follow. It's a logarithmic scale from zero to a thousand. And, you know, states of consciousness, you know, the lowest consciousness you can express to the highest that's, you know, achievable in a physical body without kind of blowing apart uh, just because you're flowing so much energy. So uh, the idea of the Hawkins scale is David Hawkins was MD, PhD, very sharp, but more importantly, uh, a very enlightened guy, you know, truly just one of those one of those individuals that comes along every couple of centuries who codifies things and breaks things down. And he made the the assessment after seeing someone do doing kinesiology and doing you know a, a test, uh, just a kinesiology test to see muscle resistance. He realized that what was actually happening there was they were tapping into the field of consciousness. And what that, what that really means is <clears throat> kind of like I was saying about um, an allergic reaction, right? Things are either constructive or destructive. So it's a very binary function. If something is true, it's stronger because there's constructive interference. And so what happens is when you get something like that, there's a sympathetic resonance and there's an increase in the amplitude. So the strength of the signal goes up. So that's why when when you ask somebody, is this healthy for you? And you, you're pushing down on their arm. If their arm just flops down, it's because they've lost tone in their muscles because there's a destructive interference. Effectively, you could say it's they're allergic to the distruth or the, the absence of, of the truth. 
And if you say, you know, is this good for you? And it's true, then there's integrity in the system and there's an increase in the amplitude to the strength of the system, including their physiology. Because as I was saying, we're not really super physical. We're actually energetic and that cascades up. So that constructive interference, you, you actually see a correlation to people's, you know, muscular impedance um, and how much they're able to resist. And so with the Hawkins scale, when you start to move through the states and you you go through kind of the normal states of awareness going up from, say, 200, where you kind of become a normal person, probably everybody that's listening to this is going to be above that threshold. And then you move up to, say, the 600s, which is kind of the, the rarefied air where you're actually starting to have, you know, kind of the experience of enlightenment. And then you move beyond that. Um, what's happening is you're your energetic potential is moving up. You're becoming more and more coherent. Truly, the the big shift um, is when you, when you hit 600, what actually changes is you become energetically coherent. And there are varying degrees of that coherence, which is you know accounting for the scale from the next 600 through 1,000. But as you become more coherent, I always tell people it's the difference between a light bulb and a laser, right? You can have the same number of emissive photons, so the same little packets of energy coming out, one warms a hot dog, one will punch a hole through steel, right? The difference is coherence. Everything is moving in phase at the same time, at the same rate, with the same intent. And that's kind of what's happening. Is So with a Hawkins skill, you're assessing reality through the lens of things being not coherent to things being completely coherent. And so with the blocks, the thing that's really kind of marvelous about the blocks is you can some of the earlier blocks were in the, the 700 range which is a very intense range but if people weren't capable of taking that in <clears throat> it would not all the time but sometimes trigger you know sweating or in the case of uh, a friend of mine uh, at a conference a couple of a couple of months back uh, he he caught me uh, Larry Pham is his name and he he called me as I was walking into the hall and we had the the new eighth gen block out, and it was at LOC was twelve hundred, right, which is exceedingly high. And he grabbed me and said, "Hey, check this out." And he was monitoring his heart rate. And when he would walk across towards it, his heart rate would go up twenty BPM. And then he would walk back and it'd drop. Then he'd walk over and it'd go up. And he'd walk back and it'd drop. And he goes, "What the hell's going on? How does how does it work?" And I said, "Well, it's there's too much energy there, right? It's kind of like." penny in a fuse box. You, you're, you're not supple enough in terms of your nervous system to handle that capacity. So you have to tailor things, which is kind of the beauty of the way the quantum upgrade works and some of the newer blocks is they actually restrict themselves so that they maximize the amount of energy that you can take in without actually triggering any sort of negative feedback in your own system. Cool. Great explanation. It's perfect explanation. There are some limitations. So if someone never worked with energy, for example, and then comes here and puts the hand in there, you know, they'll start sweating um, probably relatively quickly uh, because detox will start. So, you know, there's, it's just, it, it can't go like com- to the, it, it doesn't go to the low levels on the Hawkins scale. Like it can't do that. Uh, so it's still very powerful, but you know, um, I'm picturing like holy water on a demon. <laughs> if somebody calibrates at 65 because they're a, a psychopath, you know, it's going to be, um, it's going to affect their their coherence, I guess. Yeah. But I, I want to add to that, you know, your one question was, so how did, you know, when and how did we come up with using the Hawkins scale actually? And that's, I think, a year and a half ago, maybe, Um because we used at first the actual quantum consciousness levels, or you can call it quantum perspective levels, like the actual ones. But no one can see those. I mean, you have maybe a handful of people, 10, 20 people on earth that can actually see these levels really on the granular level. And yeah, at some point people can put it in perspective, but then people ask, so, so how is this here um, in relation to the Hawkins scale? You know, and that happened in the Telegram group. And they asked over and over again. And then we said, well, okay, let's just start calibrating some of our products. So a year and a half ago, we already told them, okay, you know, the quantum block is at 571, the infinite, basic infinity block at 733. I think the fourth generation infinity block was at 942. I, I think I brought you that one in the second podcast we had. So that was a lot at the time. And now, you know, he was talking about the almost 1,200 level 
eighth generation, I think, that we had at this conference in, in February. And yeah, since then, we've been using that. Um, for the frequency products, we shy away from using the Hawkins scale, even though we know it's always between like 500 and probably 640, uh, because the focus there is not really the level on the Hawkins scale, it's the actual frequencies. So that, that would be really measured in a different way. And then maybe some people you know, may have the question, so I just described the Hawkins scale from 0 to 1,000, but at the same time, a minute later, he talked about a block that was at 1,200, and I mentioned 2,000, and you know, also on the quantum upgrade, you can set boosters to 1,200, and actually, you'll soon be unlocked to the 1,300 and 1,400 level. That's, that happens after some time, you know, that people get unlocked for these levels. How is that possible? And the reason is that Hawkins didn't write his book yesterday. It was quite a long time ago. And when he wrote the book and basically got all the information in, it wasn't possible for any objects and frankly people on earth to vibrate at that level. So he couldn't see that. So at 1000, it was, it was over. And now you can have multiple people calibrate our products, you know, in the quantum upgrade, it is just higher. And we have with this harmony and buffer features that we're working, we added a level where it doesn't fry people, you know, like, or, you know, the detox that, that you don't have these issues. You couldn't do that with just a regular infinity block at such a level because it's just, it would be too much. But the, the energies on Earth are shifting. So Earth itself, um, or herself, whoever you know wants to do that <laughs> exercise now, <laughs> um, shifts the energy. And, and literally we see it shift dramatically in, in, a, in a positive way. And so the energy levels that we can vibrate in also change. And, and I, I feel it's a, it's a great story actually. It's, it's really a great story. And, and we always look what levels can we even make available. I think a year ago, we couldn't have made this and, and put it out with this level. And then the quantum upgrade, we probably would have stopped at, I don't know, at the level 1000. Now we're, we're introducing as we speak the 1300, 1400 booster. Yeah, because it's now possible and it is it's good. It's the right thing to do. People can tolerate it. We have the mechanism to offer it. I don't know what we'll be able to do in a year. I have no clue, but we'll see. In terms of the, um, the calibrations and checks and balances, um, if you're using muscle testing, how do you determine you know, who's actually conducting the testing accurately, right? Because, I mean, I've had people that know how to do muscle testing. I've texted stuff to Ian or Ian, sorry, uh, and then someone else and they get radically different numbers and they both, I think, are in integrity and are, have put in some time to practice it. But uh, kinesiology itself is not something that comes easily. It's something that really takes hours and hours, I mean, probably hundreds of hours of practice to get really good at it and to be able to divorce yourself from your um, your intention, right? And what you want to happen because, of course, our nervous systems are prone to hearing what we want to hear, which is why I've never been good at it because I can't seem to divorce myself from the outcome that I want to hear. So do you have, you know, a team of healers where there's cross-referencing of calibrations or how, how do you know that you're getting accurate numbers? It's not our main method, kinesiology, frankly. Oh, okay. That's a tool that someone needs to use that can't exactly see it. It's still an advanced tool and it's you need to be very advanced and very practiced and trained in order to do that right, right? And you have to be doing that for, for quite some time in order to really produce accurate results. But uh, yeah, we work with Roman Hafner together, who they call the Wunderkind in Europe. He was born with the ability to see each and every frequency on a super granular level. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just almost ridiculous what he can do already as an 11-year-old. He was on stage in front of 300 people telling all the people what, their problems, why they had the problems, how to fix them. You know, they would ask him. Doctors would book him. You know, as an eleven-year-old already, to uh, ask them, okay, how can we treat this patient? We we don't know what to do. We don't even know what he has. And he told them, oh, he has that. You know, because he can see the heartbeat, he can see everything. And so that's our main 
main one, and then we cross-reference that. And, and iron, for example, then also calibrates with muscle testing. But for us, that's a secondary method. Got it. That's okay. how I would okay. describe it. I know people listening to this, because I've already gotten questions when I post about this. So you, you're not using FLFE anymore? I'm like, no, I love FLFE. Um, but people will no doubt go, well, hey, FLFE has a sort of remote subscription service wherein they're um, elevating the level of consciousness of your location or objects and things like that. And I've been using it for years. I love it. I, I remember finding their website, researching uh, EMF solutions. And I was already long time obsessed with David Hawkins' work. And I saw that they had sort of married that scale and uh, appropriated it to their model of sending energy to your house, for example, and mitigating the EMF. And I've done shows with them. And for the record, I love it. I still use it. I have it on in the house right now. It's great. So there's no, I think people get very black and white. Like it's either this or that. What's the best? And for me, what I feel in the house is that it's very complimentary. Even though it's similar, I don't feel any um, discoherent kind of energies at all. Um, but maybe considering that I'm a fan of both, so I'm partial, maybe either either both of you or either of you could speak to what makes it different and uh, explain why someone doesn't necessarily need to have that black or white either or better or worse perspective or whatever your perspective is. Well, you want to jump in first? Well, so from my perspective, first of all, there is no it's, it's not it's not biting each other because both are really great energies. FLFE is one of the rare companies that also works with pure, good, positive energy. Um, we actually recommended them in the past while we yeah, still were well. in, in yeah. development, um, you know. But um, at the same time, you don't feel any of it because it's just too low on the Hawkins scale. It doesn't buy it, but it, it's not, you know, if you have the quantum upgrade on, it just vibrates on a way higher level. And you have something that vibrates here. Yeah, it's still there. It's not biting each other, but it's also if you left it, it wouldn't make any difference. That's frankly, um, that's the main difference in terms of the power on the Hawkins scale. It's like if you have a block that vibrates at 571, then you bring in a block into the house that vibrates at 942, it's no problem that that one is there, but the dominant energy in the house will be coming from this block. That's pretty much how the the levels work. And you know what's different? I think the level of customization is is really the key that you can level it up and down at any time. You can set specific levels for the nighttime. For example, like I always put it very low on 500 or at most 600 at night for me. And then I use the inner peace frequency. That's that's my favorite. It doesn't make you sleepy, but it's a very, you know, it helps calm the mind. That That's what it does. It's for anything stress-related and, and all that. And I just came to really love it at night and, and turn it on because it's just, it's just a wonderful energy to, to bath in, if you will. And as I said, it's near real time. You can set a lot of boosters. And yeah, I think that's, that's the main, main thing. Oh, and you can, you, know, you, can, you can have these bundles, for example. We set up like a pick three, pick four, pick five bundle. That means you can have up to five different services, for example, for your whole family. And then the question is, okay, uh, if I have that for my whole family, do I then have to manage that like for my son and for my wife? And I always have to set like their frequencies and their levels. And they always tell me, you can have this share function. And I don't know if you know that, but we added this like two months ago where you can literally add your wife to it. And then she has access not to your whole account, but to her specific service. And then she can manage it on her phone and just turn up and down the levels. But you probably, I probably forgot something, but... Well, no, I was just going to say, in terms of uh, FLFE, I love it. Um, you know, Jeff and Clayton both, I think, are really on point. And, and when I when I initially started doing calibrations, I had actually reached out to Clayton because I knew he had 
done that forever in a day. <laughs> he's, and he's masterful <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I, after uh, being exposed to Hawkins' body of work, all of it really rapidly, after you and one other friend had turned me onto it, and both of you within a 24 hour period said, Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's you know, cool. you need to check out this guy, David Hawkins. So I did. And it, it literally opened me up in a very peculiar way, but I couldn't calibrate. I, you know, that seemed to be kind of the, the cornerstone of a lot of what he was doing was the muscle testing. And so literally every day for six months, I worked on it every single day. And there was this one breaking point where uh, about six months in, I had gotten up at 3 a.m. and I was driving from Tulsa to Austin. And after about five hours of working on it, I suddenly could do it and it clicked. And it was, as you had said, it was because the, the, the breaking point was I was no longer concerned with the outcome. I was completely dispassionate about what it was. And which is funny because everybody has some intrinsic idea of what you want the outcome to be. But I would say with myself, more than 50% of the time, it's definitively not what I would like it to be. But, but you know, <laughs> I don't want to be, as the phrase would be, an asshole and ask the question, get the right answer, and then not do it. So I try to be consistent and whatever the result is, I listen. But I would I would reach out to, you know, Clayton and say, hey, is this right? Or Jeff and say, hey, is is this right initially? And how I knew I was actually doing it, because you had asked earlier, you know, like, how do you know? Well, I had a, a friend in, in Europe who could do that. And so I called him and we did it live on FaceTime and we both wrote our number down and held them up at the same time and both got exactly 544 was the number for the question we'd asked on the Hawkins scale and got the exact same number at the same time. Shout out to Tom. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that I thought, ah, viable. And then since then, I, I use it, and it seems, it's it, to my way of thinking, it's about the most scientific thing you can do because I'll do uh, a group of tests in the lab and I'll calibrate all of the answers. And then I'll still go in and run like a full spectral analysis or a full assay and almost all the time they line up. I, I just did one with a, a cancer serum and we had four different tests and three of them were spot on. One of them was off by 7%. And, you know, one, the difference is one took a couple weeks to get the data set back and the other literally just a matter of minutes. But if you think of, it, it sounds strange, but when you think we're a subset of everything universally, so of course we're plugged into it. So of course the universe is going to have some sort of reference point and relevance to it. And so the FLFE stuff, how how I came about that was when I started looking at it, I thought, wow, this is pretty fantastic. And I got the service and I got, I think, five services at the time. It was before Quantum Upgrade existed. And we were doing the, the biohacking conference and they actually, they were in my booth. I, I had shared my booth with them. And then you were directly adjacent to us. And so I think we all have kind of a mutual respect because we're all trying to move the needle in a positive direction. And for me, the the kind of the telltale thing that made me buy off an FLFE was I had a massive headache and I remember taking out my phone and they had a boost function and it went from 500 to 600. You could get a boost to 600 for 30 or for just a few minutes. And so I hit the boost function and when it went horizontal, instantly my headache went away and I thought, well, wow, that's pretty remarkable. So I, I use that for quite a while. Now I just I actually just use the quantum upgrade. Not to say that they are competing because I, I think they're they're both beneficial. Um, but I, I actually kind of like the way that you're able to tailor with your service. You're able to tailor things a little bit more. And also kind of the the relative strength of things. I, I do think one is dominant. And and from my own assessment, the other thing that I noticed that was very different is there's a there's a disparity in the amount of frequencies that are actually affected. So the quantum upgrade seems to be occurring over a, a host of frequencies that I wasn't able to touch um, with FLFE. So both great services. I think they're both viable, but my preference is at this point is definitely the quantum upgrade now, just because I think it's it's a little bit more tailored. And again, if you use both, and one is exceedingly dominant in terms of the the strength of the the signal that you're getting you you don't really need to do that you know i mean i don't need to wear six parachutes if i jump out of a plane so (laughs) (laughs) well i guess i'm a six parachute kind of guy i mean i like i said i find it to be complimentary so i i do too you know so i'm i'm sticking with what i'm doing which is both and i'm sure like Life would be great with either, but I, I definitely wanted to address that because people are already asking me, and I'm sure. Oh when yeah, this comes I get out, the, I get the same questions actually. But you know, one of the things I really do love is I love the fact that 
everybody in the space, you know, we're, we're all solving. I mean, it's kind of like me with the nanoparticle stuff, right? There are other guys doing it, and I recommend them because, you know, I had somebody ask two days ago, like, is this company? And I said, yeah, it's great. Go for it. You know, because we're all trying to move the needle for people I think to go that, to the yeah, positive. I think that's really the key here is people, I don't know, it's just, it's intrinsically, I guess, part of our nature that we want to have a camp, right? And it's like, I'm in this tribe or that tribe. And I use all kinds of different products and services all the time that um, from a very limited perspective, one could say are competitive in nature. But I don't look at the world competitively because I look at the world as a place of infinite abundance. Yeah. Right? God makes an apple tree over here, make way too many goddamn apples for anyone to ever eat. And there's a different type of apple over there. Same thing. You well, know, it's like you don't have to pick. It's everything's great with the exception of people that are obviously not in integrity or competence and are either producing things and bringing them to market that they know don't work and they want to make money or they think work and they're just, they're mistaken and, <laughs> and they don't, right? So the job for me is, I guess, in the role that I've taken on is really interviewing people like you guys and doing my best to have objective integrity and in earnest find things that I really believe uh, are real and work and and are worth people's time, energy, and money. And I think you guys, well, I don't think, I know you guys have done that because I've talked to each of you enough times about this stuff. I'm like, okay, it works. It's legit. Let's do it. Um, another question I have, I just love understanding the way things work. Do For Quantum Upgrade, do you guys have some, you know, master, what's that quadrahedron? What's that thing? The quadrahedron, <laughs> uh, what's the word? <laughs> You know, particle generator, combustor. Do you have a physical object somewhere? The Large Hadron Collider. Yes, Hadron Collider. That's what I'm thinking of. I imagine this, you know, this lab where there's lightning coming off this thing like the biocharger or something, right? Where it's like, and it's transmitting the energy. Or is it, are you just harnessing and directing energy that already exists in the field, I guess? Well, we have a large system frankly, that we've built that was part of the development process. It's an analog system, so it cannot be hacked. Um, and then the trick was to connect it to the digital front end, basically, right? Because on one end, you have you know all the people that want to say what they want to have and they want to make changes and book in the frequency and all that. And on the other hand, you have a large analog system. So building that bridge and how you do that, that was a big part of that but yeah we we do have that and we're in the process actually of um building multiple of these that we will put in various locations across the globe just because of security reasons um can tell you more uh, after <laughs> Off the, the record <laughs> uh, um well it's just something you know um it, it's something we we never want to go down and you know it wouldn't because it's analog, it doesn't ever go down, right? Really, but uh, it's still something where we want to stay ahead of the game, and uh, yeah, have multiple locations where that's active. Well, when you're dealing with a, a physical object that's producing energy that can have an effect on one's uh, state, I mean, if it were to fall into the wrong hands it could be used nefariously, right? I mean, there are, and this isn't the conspiracy theorist in me. I'm actually a conspiracy analyst for the record, not a theorist. <laughs> Expert. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, military energy weapons yeah. where they're using uh, millimeter waves for crowd disbursement and to regulate people's moods and make people have crazy thoughts and maybe even assassinate someone. I mean, this is not science fiction stuff. Yeah. This is real. And if, if you could only imagine what we don't know as citizens of the public, right? I mean, you look at technologies that roll out from um, military agencies and whatnot, and we think, wow, this is this new thing they came up with. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's probably been around for 80 years. It's new to us because they're finally yes. going, hey, you know, I mean, you look at the spraying up in the sky. I just saw an article the other day and it was like, new tech startup is going to try to limit the heat of the sun by putting particles into the atmosphere. I'm like, new, really? <laughs> I was alive in 1995, and I remember when it, I mean, it probably started before then, but when it was like undeniably present, and it's kind of the way they do things. So let's say, God forbid, something happened to you and your other founders, and some Dr. Evil got a hold of your technology. Could they use it to program to lower the consciousness of their, you know, enemies? This no. is actually one of my favorite things. Yeah. No. 
Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's impossible to do. Um, and first of all, that's it's just it's it's really a whole system. So it's it's not one device. It's actually multiple devices. Um, so to picture that, um, but the principle is the same as like with the blocks, for example. Like at the time where we made the decision that we can even publicly offer the blocks, was only because it cannot be manipulated. It cannot be used for nefarious purposes. Like you cannot in this thing a copy of fear frequency, for example. Like you think of voodoo as an example, right? You know, you could in theory come up with, oh, you know, I have a picture of this guy and I want this guy to break his leg, right? And then, you know, put the picture in and the intention, this guy will break his leg next week or something like that, right? You can think about these things, that would be something nefarious. It wouldn't work because it falls through. You cannot manipulate because it's a pure quantum energy field. And the nature of it is it supports anything regarding life and consciousness. And it neutralizes and harmonizes everything that's destructive or harmful to life and consciousness. Sounds extremely big and frankly it is because it's a form of source energy. But that's the nature of it. It cannot do anything else. So it cannot... Uh, you. you it, it would not be able to lower anyone's vibration if you said it that way or if they would load in a frequency that's a, a fear frequency, for example. It wouldn't go through. It just falls through. And so from that standpoint, it, it wouldn't be possible. I, I did mean to tell you, I'm actually going to start a new service called Quantum Hex where we send out cursed <laughs> coconuts and you can... But it's, <laughs> it's kind of a, a voodoo derivative. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, it's funny, but not funny. You know, we only accept Bitcoin. It's going to be great. We, <laughs> so. we know this stuff exists. That's the thing. I mean, well, yeah, cause actually, br- you right, can because yeah. brain waves, brain waves are malleable, and you can affect brain waves with with different frequencies. I mean, that's all brain oh, waves no, are, no, right? Exactly, and it's so. being done, and it's being done. It was especially done in the last, you know, two three years, and we noticed that, you know. Um, those big stuff, especially in big cities, you know, I, I know quite a lot about it, not because of hearing, but because of seeing and what we were able to observe firsthand, frankly. Um, and there's this stuff. But then, you know, you can counter a lot of that if you provide fields that are coherent and that are highly vibrating. And And one of the issues that so many people had in the last three, four years, right, is that they they were stuck in a fear frequency and they were stuck also in a lower consciousness level, frankly, and then everything contracts, like system-wise contracts and you just follow like a robot these things. I mean, because you're unable to expand and just look at it from a um, balanced perspective. And that is what these fields do, these high consciousness fields, they kind of lift you up, they remind you of your own connection because everything is consciousness. We're all the same. There's only one anyway. There's just consciousness. It's just expressing itself in this 3D world through our individual personalities and characters and all of that. Um, but it's, it's, it's all energy. And, and if energy is in coherence and in, in positive high vibration, you don't have to not see certain things or you don't have to act because of fear. And so in a way, it counters that. It reminds us really of our own existence and, and who we are on an energetic level. We may not, with our thoughts, not really get it, right? Because we, it's just maybe too far off. But energetically, our system, our subconscious recognizes that. Totally. And you can observe this when you spend time with someone, even in today's world where you have all of these deleterious energies and mind control and all this crazy shit going on. Uh, but you can spend time with someone who is of higher consciousness and they're totally unaffected by all of this. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I observe that. I mean, it's rare that I meet someone like that, but we just spent time, uh, Alice and I recently with a, a Vedic monk who's, you know, spent decades in the caves in the Himalayas, like real deal guy. I think I, did I send yeah. you, I sent you a link to his yeah, stuff. Yeah, you did. I can never pronounce his name, so forgive me. I'll try to find it and put in the show notes. It's a very long Sanskrit kind of name. But we're around him and we're talking to him about the world affairs. And, and he had what I would say was a compassionate and appropriate level of concern for humanity 
but he was happy as hell. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't bothering him, right? I mean, he was like, yeah, you know, we really, we need to come together. And, you know, he had some great ideas on, on how to do so. But he wasn't living in that contracted state that you described, which is what I've been working for the past, I mean, really since the beginning of 2020, let's face it, to just try to have an awareness of what's going on and not fall asleep and just be, you know, subject to whatever they are doing to us or attempting to, um, to stay aware, but also just live my life and keep my level of consciousness high, which is difficult to do when you have all these sort of um, oppressive energies coming at you. You're trying to just live your life. And it's really cool to see someone who has put in the work for enough time that is totally unaffected and just living their best life. I it's inspiring. It is inspiring, actually, because the universe is either you're expanding or you're contracting. Luckily, the universe is seemingly consistently expanding at this point. But right. you know, I mean, in terms of our energetics, we really are. We're either expanding or we're contracting. And so you can kind of move into the space and embrace it, you know, warts and all, and be happy about it. Or you can have that fear response and compress yourself and try and sequester yourself and separate yourself. And generally speaking, that, that doesn't work so well. I have noticed, um, and it, it could be partly nocebo effect, uh, but when I go into the city of Austin, obviously you guys know we live kind of in the hill country, so we're not in all the 5G and stuff, but when I go into town, this is especially true when I took a recent trip to my old uh, hometown of Los Angeles. I mean, I get into that energy and it's just like, oh, it takes so much more of me to remain myself, my positive, happy self. It's just like, oh, you can just get bombarded. What I have noticed, and this could be, you know, I don't think it's all in my mind, but I have um, one of the infinity blocks in my backseat. Uh, and I also have the quantum upgrade service on my car. And I don't care if it's placebo or not. I feel immune when I go into the city now. I used to get um, really hardcore kind of fatigue. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. Just be like zapped from energy. And when I got home, I just have to like lay down just from running a few errands in the 5G zone of downtown Austin. And I swear, I've tested it a few times. Like I get home, I'm like, all right, how do I feel? I'm like, I feel great. And I think some of it is even just being in the car. The cars have, I mean, these modern cars with the computer chips, they got a Wi-Fi router in there. There's Bluetooth. And then you're getting zapped by all of these incoherent frequencies. I mean, we know, oh, 5G is scary, but this certain megahertz is hitting with these gigahertz and they're creating, you mentioned the coherence of lasers. Yeah, They're creating their own kind of alien EMF just by crossing one another. So you get out in a car in a city, everything is working energetically against your biology and your sense of well-being. And I got, I got to say, like, whatever the reason is, I feel way better. So yeah. I have to like, and it's not a placebo. It's, it's not. It's definitely not a placebo. And we can say that because we have done the studies, literally done the studies. And the energetics is the first thing that it works on anyway, right? And then the physical is kind of like the next level because it works on the below subatomic level, really works on the energy system. And it makes sure that these EMFs, you know, I describe it always like, you know, if you were to hit me in the face, that would hurt, right? But if you were to, do some acupressure pressure on my neck, it would actually be beneficial. That's the difference uh, between just EMF and stressor exposure without having a high consciousness field from either within or just from using like the quantum upgrade, for example. Um, and it, it can be measured. You know, we've done these double blind studies that I refer to, you know, and, and recently it was the ATP production. Now I think next week or so we'll start with the wound healing but uh, there have been uh, uh, lifeblood analysis studies as well randomized double blind in 100% of the cases this stuff works and it works not just a little bit it works significantly in in a way where i mean your jaw jaw drops down truly uh, that's a hard one for german to to <laughs> say actually <laughs> And, we uh, both have a hard time speaking. That's <laughs> great. We're on an even playing field here. Yeah, to, to a point where... How are your S's? <laughs> S. <laughs> ah, damn it. <laughs> it. It is working, yeah. And so the to the point where the, the head of the base institute in Austria, when he called me to, to give me the results, because we're not present in these studies, right? We have nothing to do with that. Like, they do that, or, or Ian and, and his... You know, biochemistry professor run a run a study or some other lab, 
and then we wait for a phone call, right? Are you like and, biting your nails, waiting? God, we hope it comes out. <laughs> well, so on a deeper level, like I knew it's it's going to work and it's it's going to perform really great, and he knew that too. But still, he had tears in his eyes when he called me. He almost couldn't talk because he had witnessed with his own eyes that it worked in a hundred percent of the cases also over this huge distance and was double blind. No one had a clue. They didn't even have a clue what was going on there and, and what was happening if, if, if anything was turned on or not. And it's, it's, it's so, totally so humbling. Double blind and, meaning the, the folks that are um, conducting the study don't know and they don't the know. subjects of the study also don't exactly. know. Exactly. Only the person operating um, the quantum upgrade, I don't know how many miles away, knew what was going on and when they were going to turn something on. So it was completely double blind and it was also randomized. So they didn't, so that no one could really figure out what was happening. And, and they also made sure just because, you know, the thing is that what they, and that's what I love about them. Like they made it harder on us, frankly, because they're so detail oriented and so, so clear about it that they said they can't even do more than two people a day just because if you, have one person then in the room with the quantum upgrade that already has an effect on the other ones, and then you have oh, wow. it's a field effect. Yeah, yeah, wow. exactly. And then so they they rule that out completely, <laughs> and even take take a day break, and then invite the next people, and 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 I'm there sweating like, oh, I mean, do you want to make it even hotter? But yeah. that's the way to go, so that we know for fact this works. And this is the Besa Institute in Austria. Yes, and these are those uh, blood cell analysis slides that are on your site, right? Yes, that's correct. So they do two different things. Like the lifeblood analysis is like one of their fields that they test, but they're also the largest independent research and testing institute for uh, biosystem analysis. So they use um, the so-called BESA method. It's an advanced decavol method where they can test the cellular voltage and energy levels in all the organs and then the system in general and they can see stress levels of EMF, for example. They tested our tech in in a Tesla, actually, giving people on top of that an iPad and a phone <laughs> to use at <laughs> the same time. time. <laughs> exactly. And blasted them and then and then introduced, you know, the um, the service or the product to test. So that's that's what they do. Yeah. In in some of those studies because I was reviewing them last night because that's one thing I love about you guys. You keep doing studies. You know, it's like, hey, we did this one thing and we just let it decay on the site and that's proof, right? You're always, I'm assuming, spending a, a, a lot of money to do these studies. But I was looking at one in particular that got my attention and probably will others. And that was um, the test on double and triple vaccinated blood and man, I mean, I you know, I follow some very subversive news sources. You can see on my <laughs> on my Telegram channel, lukestory.com slash Telegram. If you have a strong stomach, I repost a lot of the stuff to just, I got to have my little voice over there going, oh, wake up, people. Um, you know, if one person sees that and chooses to, you know, um, live life as a normal breed of human, then I win. And so do they. But anyway, uh, I'm on there and... I see some really weird stuff with this blood. I mean, there's these strange clots and I mean, it gets really spooky, but in the blood, in your test, it wasn't anything, you know, um, supernatural going on or that alien, but it just looked like very unhealthy blood, right? And then the quantum upgrade was applied and then the blood is beautiful and perfect. You see all the cells aren't stuck together and mutated. And that was crazy because I, I've feared that when people have elected to do that experiment, that it might be irreversible and you're just kind of stuck with whatever comes with having blood that looks like that. But um, part of that, and maybe you guys can either or both illuminate um, this uh, on a deeper level, but it was the actual clotting was diminished. Yes. That was the part that was interesting to me because that's something that we're now beginning to see um, is more commonly known, right? Is the clotting issue with people that have elected to do that. So tell us a bit about that particular study because that one was wild. Yeah, so before you jump in, so I mean, it's been shown in the study that stage one and stage two of blood clotting was able to be reversed completely. So Yeah, not just made better, but it's not there anymore. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. And 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 so for people that don't know, so people were tested just, regularly tested and then there was no Wi-Fi turned on. 
Then Wi-Fi was turned on and people got tested again. And then you can see the huge differences. So you, and you really see that the blood of everyone got really bad very quickly. For some people, really, it led to even stage two of blood clotting, right? Because they were already having not so great blood to begin with. For other people, it was a little bit different. But in, in all cases, it, it was this huge clumping. Like, it looks immediately unhealthy to everyone that doesn't even know anything about Garfield <laughs> microscopy. You know, oh, no, that's not how it's supposed to look like, right? And then um, they left Wi-Fi on and then turned the, the quantum upgrade on. And within, I think it was 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, that's usually what they use, um, all of that was reversed. And then on top of that, many other things, right? The white blood cell activity is another thing that actually uh, white blood cells get paralyzed through Wi-Fi. They tend to get paralyzed. In our studies, it shows usually they do get paralyzed uh, at least instantly. And that's part of your army. That's part of your immune system. So the white blood cell activity and motility always increased in these, these cases. And they even showed things like a decrease in parasitic load um, and then, you know, the oxygenated blood. So all of these things happen. We certainly can't make any claims in regards to, you know, if someone participated in this experiment, there's a lot of stuff going on there that goes really beyond Wi-Fi exposure. And there's things that we nowadays see that are really crazy indeed. But, you know, for the for the regular stuff that's not good for your blood, this obviously shows significant improvements. Uh, we, we are running a study actually at the moment. It's a pilot study with D-dimer tests or D-dimer tests are part of that. It's a clinic in Florida running that uh, because D-dimer tests, they can spot micro blood clots. So they are very, very micro really. And uh, so we're looking at the effects of that. Yeah, that's a... Uh, well, I, you know, I appreciate that you can't make claims and thank you for being respectful enough to people to not say, hey, it's going to cure you of this or that. But what you can claim is black and white. I mean, there's yes. Yeah, you can look at like, the images. Yes. This is what happened for those test subjects. We don't know that it's going to happen for every single person, but I would be willing to hedge my bets <laughs> if it did that for them. I'll give it a shot for whatever few bucks a month, you know. Well, those um, things, you have when you, to add? Yeah, when you, when you look at that, it's microvascular coagulopathy, right? And so you, you see those things clumping. And what's really going on there, especially in those experiments, is the exposure to the EMFs. And we've talked about this before. All, at a subcellular level, all that stuff is, is voltage-gated calcium ion channels, right? So it's not some nefarious, you know, evil plot. But when you apply a field at 2.4 megahertz, you can affect a change in voltage-gated calcium potentiation. And so the influx and the efflux uh, of calcium in your cells, which allows them to process waste and to move and to be healthy and to perform their normal functions, gets skewed. And so you've got one type of EMF throwing off a magnetic system or an ionic system. And so that's what's really going on there. And so in these cases where people are already marginalized, they're hosed. And to, to use this, we're trying to address something at an even more subtle level. And I, I always go back because it's hard for people to grasp this. But I think about, you know, before the microscope, pre von Leeuwenhoek, right? If you had walked up to someone and said, you're sick because these little microscopic bugs that you can't see. Well, you probably wouldn't have used the term microscopic at that point, but you know, <laughs> you know, these little things, they're they're there and they're they're affecting your physiology and they're hurting you. You would have thought the person was a nutter. And so, you know, we're looking at things that are at such a subtle level that we we don't I personally don't have, nor have I seen, a quantumometer anywhere. So I don't have, you know, coming I, soon, I, hopefully. <laughs> new pocket quantumometer. You'll have a lot less explaining it's to do. App. You're just like, here, look. It's, <laughs> yes. right there. it's a new app we're gonna put out, the quantumometer. Um, but you know, bef before we have the tools to really identify it directly, we're having to do all this stuff indirectly, but you can definitively see the shifting for people who are marginalized when there's just a little external stress applied, the results just are very poor, right? The outcomes are very poor. So yeah, we can't make a claim that it's going to happen all the time, nor would I make a claim that if I dropped my coffee cup, it's going to land on the ground every time. But when you're, when you're dealing with fundamental forces, you can pretty safely say that you're going to be able to elicit some positive benefit the majority of the time. So yeah, so in these tests, we're we're talking about the influence of quantum fields, right? Mm -hmm. 
but then the tests are actually in the realm of the physical. And so right. that's the way that you can essentially prove the effects of quantum energy is by observing their effect on something you can measure, which yeah. is in, in this case, blood cells or right. HRV or different things like that. Um, I, I don't know enough about the dark field microscopy uh, to you know, say that it's valid or not. I know that I've had it done on myself. First time was maybe... Uh, 15 years ago on this Magnetico sleep pad, I was at a conference and they go, you want to see something cool? Yeah. They took some of my blood, put it in the microscope, kind of coagulated, not that pretty. I laid on this, I think a 20 Gauss um, mag magnetic uh, uh, mat, which I have in the guest room there mm -hmm. under, under the mattress still to this day because I bought one on the spot, <laughs> which was a lot of money for me at the time. I forget what it was, but it was like, like I could have bought a car, you know, at that stage. Anyway, they did my blood before. I laid on this thing for 10, 15 minutes. Afterward, I was like, okay, sold. Um, so, you know, when you see it on your own blood, it's pretty impactful. But I have heard uh, people speak out against the validity of this type of test. And I don't know what their argument is. Have you guys, is yeah. there a valid argument against the dark field microscopy? So, no, uh, that's the real answer, no. Um, but if you think about it, if that tool was still used widely in the U.S., what could it be used for? You could, you could take a pill and see what happens, right? So here's the thing: what happened in uh, in the U.S. about 20 years ago? It was a widely used tool, and then they decided to charge every practitioner that wants to continue to use dark field microscopy as a diagnostic tool $100,000 as a fee. Per year. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. And that's how this. you <laughs> conveniently make things go away because people can't afford to do it anymore. It's still allowed in the US for research purposes. I mean, it's also allowed as a practitioner, but you have to still you have to pay the license. So um, in Europe, it's still a widely used tool. It's amazing because it's frankly the only tool where you can see everything in your blood going on in real time in an illuminated way and in a magnified way. It's not some um, fiction that you see there, you see your actual blood. You see your actual red blood cells, white blood cells in real time. So it's the perfect way to look at the over, overall health, frankly. So there's actually no real argument against it. There is though, you know, there's probably people out there that misuse it in a way where they just take a before and an after picture in a for them convenient way. And that's why we don't do it that way. That's how we got started, frankly, to, to figure out what are the real changes that we're promoting with these products, right? That's what you want to see. But you can't just offer a person one before and one after picture and say, oh, just look at this. This is great. That, that's why you design these randomized double-blind and single-blind studies so that you can rule out the placebo effect completely and you need to be able to show that it really happens in, in all these cases, not just as one-off. Right, not so, like me on the... Because one could yeah, say when I exactly. got on the Magnetico that I could have believed that it was going to change the look of my blood. Therefore, it did, which is, which is true. I mean, you can you sure. can meditate yeah. your way into feeling very differently and probably change your physiology just by the kind of thoughts and feelings you're having. And we know this, but the way you're doing it in an external lab and double blind and all that kind of eliminates that, which is, I think, the important distinction there. Yes, you, you use this sham device. So then you would get tested multiple times and you never know, is this now the real mat or is this the fake mat? Basically, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, that's right. kind of how it works. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, Ian, could you wax poetic on the... Uh, <laughs> I know you can do this and I just love hearing you talk because I can usually barely hang on. It's a fun ride. Um, the, quantum, the quantum entanglement element of this with quantum upgrade, how we have this, you know, generator or this analog technology that's in one location. And then over here in my house, because I have software that's communicating with that via the internet, is telling that machine to make something happen over here. Like, how is that happening? Because I think that's, despite these tests and these ways that have, you know, validated that something positive is happening, it's really hard for me and I think a lot of people to get our head around how something like that can work. I think that, I think that's pretty hard for almost everybody to get their head around because it, it is in truth. I mean, you know, Einstein and Niels Bohr had an argument about what was really going on there. And until, you know, the guys got the Nobel Prize for solving Bell's inequalities, um, you know, 
with testing to prove which which was which. And in this case, actually, Einstein was wrong and Bohr was right. Um, you have this whole, everybody's heard of the term spooky action at a distance, right? The idea that something remote has an effect on the other thing. And Einstein's supposition was that, you know, the, the, those things were connected and when you affected one, the other. And that's, that's not exactly right. It's, it's actually, Niels Bohr was right. The, the states aren't predetermined um, until you actually observe them. And, and what's really strange about this is it's not actually affecting a change on something at a distance it's affecting a change on itself because once you entangle something, it ceases to be a separate entity. It's one consistent waveform. So what you're actually pushing on one side of something and the other side is connected because they're a uniform waveform. And so it's tricky because we're big meat suit macro creatures. And so we think of, you know, Phillips over here, I'm over here, you're over there. And so until you take enough psychedelics. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You meditate for a couple of decades, take a bunch of psychedelics, you're gonna be fine. All that home. disappears. Yeah. Then you understand this perfectly. Totally different experience. And then the you come side. out of the experience and you go you go back into thinking it's real again. <laughs> yeah, well it's it's a persistent yeah, yeah, it's a persistent illusion. It's it's a really pleasant one too. I you know, I enjoy it. Um, but the, the the thing is when physicality is, in my opinion, the epiphenomenon of consciousness, right? So it's not that we are aware and have a brain and then the brain generates consciousness. I think that's ridiculous. I think really what's going on is we have a consciousness and then because of that, we coalesce to a form. And it's much easier to think about how all of this stuff could actually work if you think of yourself as a waveform, right? And so remotely, if one waveform wants to and expresses the intent to, interact and couple with another waveform, right? You're reaching out for the assistance of something else. You're trying to connect with it. Um, then to my estimation, based on what we've seen, and we're doing the same thing. We're eliciting a coupling of the waveform, right? And I think that the interesting part there is there has to be express intent. You know, you have to want to do it. And it's kind of like, uh, to go back to the Hawkins thing, people who uh, were, in his assessment, atheists could not use the tools, right? They weren't able to calibrate because by virtue of denying the connected nature of everything, you simply didn't get access to it, right? You know, and I always jokingly say that, you know, the universe is an, an idiot. It doesn't give toddlers pistols. You know, you, you have to accept that there's a connected nature between things. And when you express the intent, in this case of, I want to get the, the beneficial expression of something for someone else or for myself, then you're, you're eliciting a, a positive response because you're entangling those waveforms. So you're no longer something that's completely separate. You've actually melded with them. And that's, I think that's one of those things that's it's just hard to grasp that we are, in fact, all connected. And when you open the gates up and you're willing to express, I want to enhance this connection for some positive beneficial outcome, then it actually begins to happen. And that's, that's I mean, we're, we're proving that definitively. And as hard as it is to grasp, the universe is much more of a large thought than it is a large thing. And I like that. That's tweetable. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's <laughs> what's really happening here is we're, we're at the very cutting edge of that. So we're able to see that and demonstrably show that. And, you know, in my case, in a university setting and the base Institute and all these different places where we're actually getting the data and saying, yeah, I, I get that. It, it seems peculiar. I know that it doesn't make sense the way that we're taught, but obviously we need to make some new assessments because what we were expressed and taught as, you know, kids growing up and all the way through school, it needs a little bit of adjusting. And so I think that's really where it's at is once you realize that there's a connected nature between all things and that you're asking to enhance that beneficial aspect, then it happens. There goes Newton's apple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, something comes to mind with that, and I'm sure everyone listening has experienced this, and maybe you just write it off as a fluke, but it's the phenomenon when you're thinking about someone and they call you. I mean, it's not like that happens once, right? I mean, it happens it, all the time. If you pay attention, it's kind of always the way it happens, right? Literally two days ago, I was having a, a meeting, or actually it was Monday, so uh, four days ago, I was having a meeting with my staff, and I mentioned in the meeting that I was going to be leaving to come see you on Thursday, which is our, uh, our other meeting of the week. And right after I said your name, you texted me. There instantly. you go. <laughs> Just, yeah. 
There's a great study actually comes to mind, totally unrelated to what we're doing, but this guy proved actually in a larger study that each time um, someone started to drive home to their dog and the dog had been alone uh, you know, throughout the day, the dog already, they had installed cameras and the dog already knew the person would come home now. Yeah, Rupert Sheldrake. And uh, it was okay. starting to run around, look around, get ready um, for mom or dad to come home. And it's, yeah, so it's, and, and we can be, the more tuned in we are, the more we can observe these signals. Now, as you described, we're so much in this 3D world and there's so much stuff going on. There's so many interesting offerings out there, right? Uh, that we get distracted from that and then we don't practice anymore. So it's sort of that, that's what I always tell people like to to know these things or you know to to calibrate or see things or you know do energetic things everyone can do that it's not not a single person that can't do it everyone can do it it's just something it's like a muscle that we didn't use for a couple of years well i mean then if if you don't use your leg for just 3 weeks you don't use it at all for just three weeks. You won't be able to walk afterwards just like you did before. It's going to be very, very difficult. That's the same thing. It's just something, if we can just keep training that and being in a high consciousness fields and allowing our inner voice to come through, then we stay tuned in. And and that's the, that's the whole trick, actually. So true. You know, I think about um, my fascination with mystics and sages and specifically... Uh, those that have developed the uh, abilities to perform cities, right? That can manifest an object from here to over there. Or, you know, the classic, uh, the levitating monk, right? And I've had firsthand accounts of of many of these things for for a lot of years, um, and I've witnessed a couple pretty pretty supernatural things. But it's almost as if we're trained to disbelieve. In that there's some sort of grid, a system, our school systems, all the ways that we're taught to just tether ourselves to the physical, provable quotes reality. Yet here are these outliers through discipline and you know focused dedication, develop these kind of powers that seem supernatural. But it's universal that those that are able to, I mean, just like I guess I don't know the Bible well, but I think Jesus says these miracles that I'm doing, so can you, right? It's like we look at them as special. And then when you ask them, they say, I'm not special. You can do this too. And you're like, how do I levitate? Well, <laughs> give it 40 years in a cave, you know, and do this breathing practice and move this way and that way. And you'll be able to manipulate matter like I can, you know, but we're, we're kind of, I don't know. It's a, it's a shame that humans are, some of us at least, depending on who's raising us, are kind of just uh, made to not believe in magic and that it's, that it's not real yet. It's in front of us if we if we have eyes to see it. Yeah, that's the the reason is because this three D reality basically couldn't be controlled by anyone if anyone had access to the real magic and the knowledge of it and the remembering right, of that. Right. And that's the whole reason because you know these things don't happen without a reason, right? It always follows a plan and an agenda. But the thing is, above that, there's also the universal agenda. So everyone is just always playing a role that is meant to be, since it's all one anyway, and all the bad things that are happening are meant to happen. Um, and frankly, if these pushy things wouldn't happen, and maybe mind control and negative energy manipulations, then certain other things wouldn't happen. So I call this the scissors effect that we have right now, right? There's all the dark things that we witness and they come to light, right? Because of all the corruption and what's going on that, you know, is, is kind of like this part of the scissors. But it's the awakening that is also happening. Like, And, and it's not just a word, it's really awakening. Like people awake two certain things that are going on and they realize that once you are at a higher state suddenly and you see something, you can't unsee it. It just is impossible. And then you will actually see more at some point and that's the other. And that's where we are right now. It's a magnificent time it from is. my perspective. I, thank you for reminding me of that because um, sometimes in the world today, it's, it's easy to get focused on the other side of that duality, right? There's, yeah. there's such, a, <laughs> such a drastic polarity, right? Because as you have this percentage of people that are awakening and 
gaining higher states of consciousness and so on, you have these dark forces that are just like ghouls coming out of the shadows. Ah, ha, 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 you know, World Economic Forum and all of them, you know, we know who they are. Or at least I think I know who they, am, they are. Uh, but it's difficult to see that at the same time, unless you really pay attention, there are vast numbers of people becoming interested in and exploring all sorts of realms of spirituality and um, and bettering themselves and waking up, you know? And it's really interesting how the universe is set up in that perfect duality. And it, it for me, it takes a constant zooming out and sort of surrendering my judgment as to what I think is good or bad. Because in 20 years from now, you'll probably look back on the, what I perceive to be in many ways, the dark ages right now with these oppressive powers just kind of strangling humanity that this is the catalyst that's going to take us to the next level right. it's like when you look back at the viking hordes you think oh the barbarism how could they and then it evolved into slavery <laughs> right which was which is a great move which was a huge improvement <laughs> versus just coming into your village and slaughtering and raping everyone right at least now you get to live under you know even though you're subjugated to someone else's will and you're being exploited and then now you know over time we moved out of hopefully in most places in the world out of you know the barbarism of slavery and now we're in kind of a digital slavery. sort of a digital slavery you know <laughs> under, the, <laughs> under the control of the central banks and taxation right and then there'll be hopefully one could think a point at which we go oh my god remember when we had to pay taxes back in the 2000s or whatever right and we'll think oh yeah but it's it's kind of like um you know if you think of it as a graph the consciousness of humanity is, is steadily going up over time. It seems to be the way that God and nature has designed it. But then there's also these, these dips along the way, right? But still, it's steadily climbing. And, and I can observe this even in my short, minuscule lifetime. Yeah, I mean, over the past couple thousand years, there's definitely been quite the improvement. But you have to have something to push against, right? You know, I mean, if you were in a frictionless environment, you don't make much headway because you can't get any traction. Right. right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Running on ice, right? Yeah, yeah. And the one thing we can be certain of, and that can maybe give some people peace of mind, is, you know, what some of these people that you referenced, what they're trying to do ultimately is they're trying to contain consciousness and keep it down. Ideally, they would like to destroy it or just put it away and contain it. <laughs> That's Good luck funny. with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's impossible. It is yeah, impossible because yeah. it's the only thing that it, it's the only that's what exists. It is it. There's nothing else but consciousness, and aspects of consciousness cannot contain consciousness. It's 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 a catch twenty two. It, and it'll never the, happen. Yeah, and they'll just. Bite and bite and bite until they lose their teeth. And maybe that's um, the futility in fighting evil also, right? Because it has its place to Ian's... Ian, God, why do I keep saying that? I've known you for years. <laughs> I've never called you Ian. That running on ice, right? We, we need that friction and we, we need the contrast of, of this experience here on the planet. There has to be a, a sort of a um, spectrum of choices for us so that we can use our will to be good and to do good, right? And to express love rather than the lack yeah, thereof. You don't, you don't fight it. It's, you know, I'm going to quote Gandhi, you know, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. You don't fight hatred and fear and darkness with hatred and fear and darkness. You bring the light. You know, right. You bring it. <laughs> I, I saw this, I saw what was happening kind of in the, um, was it the, what was the election when Donald Trump won 2020? Yeah. Okay. I or saw no, no, well, when, when he won, but they did not acknowledge yeah, no, it, you no, mean? Yeah, or? No. Oh, no, 2016. 2016. Okay, sorry, yeah. I'm bad at politics. <laughs> but I noticed this emergence, um, and, you know, like he was an utter failure in most ways, from my estimation. Again, I'm no expert in politics, but it was interesting to see his rise and the rise of people that were like, we hate people that hate people. It was like, <laughs> we, we hate hate. And I'm, I'm thinking, you guys, like... <laughs> you are you're hating right now you know it's just it's anyway intolerance of intolerance <laughs> yeah it's, it's, a, it's a strange social phenomenon like you guys it's, you're not going to get rid of this guy by hating because you think he hates anyway i digress uh deeply i do want to talk about um emf more specifically because i love to talk about it um okay you have two schools of thought and i've done all kinds of work on this house it's a great sort of case study where i've had um i've had brian hoyer from uh, shielded healing come in when we were doing the building 
And then most recently, uh, Ryan Blaser from testmyhome.com. And these guys are building biologists, right? So they're, when it comes to EMF, they are only working in the realm of provable physics, like straight up physics, right? They have a meter and there is either a field present or there is not. And until you do shielding and blocking and there is no more field present, your house is not mitigated. You still have EMF, right? And I've asked both of them this. What about you know, what about Leela? What about FLFE? What about quantum upgrade? What about the blue shield scalar things? And they're like, hey, they might work, but we're only talking about what's provable. So what I did just to hedge my bets because I can't stand being around EMF is the bedrooms are shielded and there's all this blocking and shielding and I have all this stuff on in the house as well. And it feels great. Anyone that comes in here um, universally says, wow, God, it feels really good in here. Um, and there's just very low ambient EMF because we're kind of in the country. But how does something like quantum upgrade, which, you know, things like this use the term harmonize, how does that harmonize those chaotic fields in a way that that we can explain or, you know, or prove? I know we can prove like, hey, you put a Wi-Fi router next to someone's head, you test their blood, their HRV, and so on. And you can see, wow, when this other field is present also, it seems to eliminate the deleterious effects of that. But in the in kind of the quantum entanglement realm, how exactly are these incoherent fields being made coherent? I'll take a I'll take a crack at it first. So when when you think of an EMF field, right? Again, people think of a wave as just something like this, this simple function. It's not. There's actually a tremendous amount of things happening, and there are multiple waves inside one wave. You're actually seeing a lot of different spectra, right? That's why you do a spectral analysis is because there are a lot of different things happening, and so it goes back to what I had said earlier. Some things are constructive, some things are destructive. And what you're really trying to do is just mitigate the things that trigger destructive interference. And so it's kind of like sunscreen, right? You can go out in the sun, but if you put on a good sunscreen, it doesn't matter that the rays are still there. The the deleterious effects, as you said, are, are negated, right? And so this is the same thing. You're going to have EMFs present, but if you can negate the things that are destructive in their nature in terms of the interference patterns that they set up with your physiology, it doesn't matter. You can have them there all day long and you're effectively immune to it because it's going to move through you without triggering an issue. Uh, you know, I mean, we're subject to microwaves all the time. A lot of it has to do with the, the force and the focus and, you know, the, the, uh, the intensity that, I mean, you wouldn't want to go climb into uh, your microwave and turn it on, but you can be around a microwave tower um, because the intensity is different, the focals, the focal point is different. But we're kind of using quantum behavior to negate the detrimental interactions, and that's it. So it's just you negate destructive interference patterns, and so that cascades up into your physiology. Because really, ultimately, nobody cares about the EMFs; they care about the physiological impact of the EMFs. So you can still have the the thing there without it triggering some negative effect. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I was thinking about. Uh the biocharger that I have downstairs and I was, I was watching the little software interface and it said, uh, you know, 900 kilohertz or whatever it was. It has these different cycles mm -hmm. that it runs through and I'm looking at that and I'm going, this thing's EMF. <laughs> you know, I was like, duh. <laughs> I mean, you can hold a right. fluorescent bulb in front of it with your hand and it lights up. I mean, it's putting off a tremendous amount of EMF, but it's a different frequency. It's hopefully frequency. Right. It's constructive, right? Yeah, and so like when you were at my lab, you know, I have the Lakovsky chair with, you know, the, the coils. And so basically your body is the impedance between two sets of Tesla coils, one sending and one receiving. And that actually charges your cells because it's constructive interference. And you can sit in the middle of that and you feel juiced in the most positive way. You get out of it and you're like, wow, I feel great because it's actually feeding your cells. I mean, we are not just physical. I mean, you could say a, a human is photonic and auditory and magnetic and ionic. And, you know, I mean, we've got all these different components. That's why when you're trying to fix someone and help them, you can't just address one thing, right? You have to look at a person and say, okay, we're going to give you something chemical to knock this out. And then we're going to do this to take care of the electromagnetic portion. And then we're going to use red lights to negate this. And, you know, because we're, we're an amalgam, we're not just one two dimensional thing. We're this, you know, big coalescing of all these different things happening. So our, if you looked at a, the EMF spectra of a human, 
it's amazing. There's so much stuff coming off uh, in, in all sorts of different ranges, you know? And so what we're doing is we're just positively amping up the stuff that's beneficial and, and trying to negate the things that are destructive. So EMFs, if they're just, they're just a, a wave, right? It's electromagnetic radiation, right? So that's the sun. That's the lifeblood for our entire planet, right? You that's, know, you know that, I'm going to shield all the EMFs by triggering a supernova. That's a bad yeah, idea. Totally. Well, that, it's funny because the, the EMF skeptics argument is like, what, go outside. That's EMF from the sun and, you know, magnetic field of the earth and all that. But to me, the defining characteristics there is native versus non-native, right? So we're dealing with this positive quantum energy that we're discussing today. That's a native energy. These are fields that are present universally versus the cell tower down the road that some yeah we we evolved that way human resonance yep and thankfully this can override you know this um non-native form of emf like the 5g 4g microwaves and it overrides it in a way where you can still benefit from all the convenience of using Wi-Fi and 5G and all of that. Says the man have, who used to work in telecommunications. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. Well, but, but, but even if I hadn't, I mean, honestly, everyone sees the benefits of being connected in a way, right? It, there's Absolutely. convenience factor to it and, and it would be... Dixie cups and string at, only goes so far. Of, yeah. <laughs> at this point of evolution, it would be... Um, it, it's a hard catch to now trying to change the world in a way where we shut off all the EMFs, that's not going to happen. So we need to find ways how we can live with it in a positive way. And from my perspective, you know, I mean, yeah, certain rooms can be shielded and all that, but you can't shield yourself and wouldn't want to do that um, permanently and everywhere from it, right? Well, there's, um, you know, there's an interesting uh, counter perspective to shielding your bedroom. Because of the native frequencies, these micro frequencies, I guess you could say subtle energies, cosmic energies that we're meant to have, that you're blocking those scalar energy and whatnot, right? So they're, 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 there's a subset of people that think it's a really bad idea to make a Faraday cage out of your bedroom because you're blocking everything, including those beneficial frequencies. Thankfully, not this. So, you know, um, you, you may be actually right with, uh, with blocking off certain types of energies that way as well. And, and that may not be good. But at the same time, you have this and this will also go through into your bedroom. It that, doesn't I mean, stop. That's um, good to know. And I, I think for me, I just, I think that quantum energy and scalar energy is going to permeate that kind of gross level of shielding that's keeping out the megahertz and gigahertz of the cell tower down the road. Yeah, it will. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of things that we, we evolved with, like the Schumann resonant cavity, right? The earth resonates at a certain frequency due to lightning strikes on the surface. And there's kind of a balance between the grounding of the earth and the ionosphere. Every cell in our body has evolved for literally billions of years from the time we were single-celled organisms to now in the presence of that field, right? We want that field. If we didn't have that, you know, in outer space, if you're on the ISS, you're going to have an issue if you're not exposed to that sort of thing because everything has that kind of heartbeat pulse that every cell in our entire physiology has evolved with. There was a, an experiment, and I wish I, I knew more details about it, but I forget what country it was in or what year, but there was an experiment wherein they created essentially an underground house and put all of these subjects in it where they weren't exposed to any of these beneficial frequencies and they all got super sick in the course of a month. I, I wish I remembered more information about it, but it was, it was a real study and they went, oops, we're not supposed to live underground. <laughs> you know? That was the crux of it. So when we think about people being in caves, they're not actually totally enclosed, right? So I think they had some sort of air <laughs> tubes and things like that. So there was oxygen, but they were cut off from those beneficial life-supporting fields and it did not go well. And that was kind of the end of people trying to live underground. You know, one of the things what you were saying, Philip, about, you know, we wouldn't want to have a, a life without the conveniences that we have now. My personal take is the connectivity is really helping move humanity forward. Not to say that the internet breeds the, uh, the you know, the best outcomes in people, but in, in general, the fact that we're all connected now, the, in my field, in technology, when you're looking at the evolution of science and the progression of technology, it's happening now at, at an accelerated race, 
or accelerated pace just because of the connectivity of people, right? It, you know, 500 years ago, if I had some idea and I wanted to talk to another expert about it, it would take weeks and weeks and weeks or months and months and months and in some case years. Your pigeon might have right. died along the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, but now it's damn near instantaneous and that's really pushing us forward. But there are times when as a technology, something might be uh, a little detrimental, but ultimately when it's integrated, you know, you go through periods like in physiologically, exposure to deuterium is really harmful, right? Um, but when you're a young child, you actually need a slightly enhanced level because it triggers growth, right? There's, there's a reaction. It's kind of like a hypertrophy, right? You want the inflammatory response when you tear your muscles, you know, that's what triggers the growth. And I think culturally, that's kind of what's happening is we're at that weird point where we're expanding culturally and we're getting this kind of connectivity and we're becoming more of a one kind of conglomerate planet where we're all trying to work together. But we're having some harsh growing pains, you know, and I, I would like to think that, you know, the, the things that we're doing like this are going to help mitigate some of those detrimental effects. But over time, we'll move into the light. People will start to figure it out. They'll start to realize like, oh, yeah, this was great. But, you know, it turns out we don't want DDT on all of our crops. <laughs> right. you know, factory farming, maybe not the best thing, you know, but it's incremental, right? We've got to, you know, we don't want to lambast ourselves too harshly for the things that we're doing because we're trying a lot of cool stuff. Some's going to work, some's not going to work. Well, to that end, I envision uh, a future world where we have cell towers everywhere, right? And we're able to be interconnected, which I agree is the best thing ever. I mean, it's, it's I think it's a thing that's saving humanity is our ability to communicate ideas instantaneously because the ideas that the baddies want suppressed, even with censorship, they can't keep it down. Like people are going to talk. But I imagine cell towers everywhere that are putting out like, Leela and quantum upgrade frequencies and using those carrier waves to transmit data just like we are now, but actually with frequencies that are supportive of our biology rather than deleterious. We tested that actually with a really? 5G tower. Yeah, it was extremely successful. That was great energy for the whole neighborhood. Um, we only did it for, I think, like two, three hours. And uh, yeah, but it's not for us to do. You know what I mean? Like that's what I'm meant about integrity it's there's free will out there and and there's also th things you can't do because it would be manipulative also if it sounds great if we now you know turn on all the towers it's not it's not the right thing to do at this point at least and maybe there will be an evolution towards that at some point so i even thought you know i don't know give it another year or two and then maybe I can talk to my old colleagues at T-Mobile and, you know, still know tons of people there. And at that point, maybe they're open to that and we just do something together, right? You know, but it, it needs to be right. But the possibilities are definitely, definitely there. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, my lithium in the tap water idea just got mixed. So. <laughs> I mean, you can go to some hot springs that are high in lithium and kind of get that effect. Uh, well, man, I, th I think we've covered just about everything I wanted to cover here. Let me just check my notes. Um, oh, one question I had, and we may have covered this in the in the very beginning, is people that already have the Leela quantum devices physically in, in their possession are probably going to be wondering, well, now why would I want the quantum upgrade service? I think you talked about this with the ability to charge things and stuff. Um, how are they complementary and how are they overkill if that's possible? Yeah, so I mean, there's already a lot of people that have both. Um, <laughs> well, this is going to be a necklace. It's hard to wear as a necklace. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there's actually a lot of people that have both. And, and the, the reason is because you can customize up and down the Hawkins scale, basically adding frequencies and all of that, setting boosters and nighttime values and all of that with a quantum upgrade. So it... It's more powerful, it's more harmonious, it goes deeper, and it's it's just so flexible and customizable. It's something you cannot do with a block, or even if you have two or three blocks, you're always limited uh, uh, in a way in that regard. But then the quantum upgrade has the limitation, really, as I said earlier, you can't, you know, if you have sugar that you want to harmonize or other foods, for example, structure your water, charge your silver. Or if you want to copy frequencies, right? That's also an application that a lot of people use it for. 
you can't do that with a quantum upgrade. So for that, you need a physical device. So that's really the main differences, I would say. Okay, got it. Yeah. And with this, with this big daddy here, where the hell should I put this thing in the house? <laughs> well, because I, I, ha- I have the quant the quantum block on the kitchen island, then I have an infinity block in my office, which is where I unfortunately spend the most time in my life right now. But I was thinking when you walked in with this, I'm like, where am I going to put this thing? So, you know. A lot of people wanted a larger block for the kitchen so they can put their whole plates in there ah, and okay. all of that. So that's that's one idea at least. And then another one is living room where you can easily maybe even put your legs in or, or your head and shoulders and all of that. But I would just, you know, when we're all gone here, you just tune in and figure out where you want to put it. You'll have some impulse. When I do a um, breath work session or meditation or something, is there any harm in me laying with my head in this for 20 minutes to 60 minutes? Well, and not necessarily. You know, it would be very beneficial at first. And then I would just feel. Because that's what we always tell people. This is not... We can't give you a manual like for a Samsung TV. You know, you turn it on here, and this is what it's going to do, uh, and all that. It's it's everyone is so different. We we tell people to feel, and for some people, that's like okay. Um, <laughs> I'm but even, then, I'm kind of like that. But if but know? if you do that, and and you're tuned in enough that you will feel it, okay. and and the worst thing that can happen is that you feel it maybe two, three minutes too late. <laughs> and what right. you do then, you just drink a glass of water and you'll okay. be fine. So, uh, Do you think I could submerge this in my pool for a period and structure the water in my pool? Um, well, probably. I mean, energetically, it doesn't make... It, it, it doesn't impact at all the device. I don't know what it will do to the, to the material. Um, but I think if you put it in the in the pool for a little bit, uh, you should probably be fine. Um, but you know what I would do actually, um, you won't get as much of a charge, but it will still be enough. Take a picture of the pool, print it out, and put it in there. Okay. Yes. Okay. And and that's the way how we do it. For example, we, we bought uh, for a place in Costa Rica. We bought this huge antique uh, dining table. And it's massive. You need like 10 people to move it. And while well, you can't move it into a block and it's also way too big for a block. So I took a picture and put it inside. And then it, it neutralizes all these energies that were still stuck in there from the last few hundred years of, I don't know, uh, you know, maybe someone got murdered on the table or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But the, the cannibals uh, some, that used to own it. <laughs> it was beautiful, but it had some bad energies in it and it was completely gone and it's vibrating nicely. Wow. And that's what you can do cool. with way larger objects. And awesome. it's cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking I might just put it in this room, which is where most of the dedicated spiritual practice takes place. Just keep it, and you know that already, but for everyone out there, if you have like more than one block, always keep them two, three meters apart at least. That's How many the feet only, is that? Uh, I would say that's about six, seven, eight feet. Oh, okay. So six feet minimum. Okay. Yeah. Easy to do. So as long as I am apart, yeah. got it. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad both of you were able to drop in. You know, we're going to follow this with a solo recording with Ian in a little bit, but... Um, I like having both you guys because you, you know, Ian's able to bring more of the rigorous science, yet still a spiritual guy, and and you, you know, a bit more of the energetics of it. So you guys make a really great team and great guests on the show. So thank you so much. Thanks, man. Happy and also, to be here. Th- thank, yeah, you, thank, thank you, Ian. And and both of you individually, you with Wizard Sciences, um, and you with everything you're doing in the quantum realm. I just want to express my gratitude for continuing to keep the research going. Right, and I just be like, eh, we nailed it. It works. We know it works. Like, we're good. Because I'm assuming that these studies are not cheap. I mean, you're no, you know, they're not. <laughs> you're employing a group of sci- scientists, you know, that are using labs, and you know, so thank you for doing so. It's meaningful because it makes my job easier when someone comes to me and is like, oh, how do I know this works? I'm like, I, you know, I feel it. I feel great. That doesn't say a lot for some people, but I go look at the studies. That's why I always say on your websites is I'm like, go look at the studies. I mean, that's, I don't know what else you want, you know? And if, if you don't think it works, then don't do it. You know, it's a free, <laughs> it's a free world. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that, that is helpful, especially for um, 
the more pragmatic types that are like, ah, I'm not intuitive. I'm not tapped into subtle energies and things like that. Like, um, and, and I'm even like that sometimes, especially compared to Allison who walks in a room is like, oh yeah, that person over there, this is what's going on with them. Could just see stuff that I can't see, which is great, you know, but the rest of us need a little work and we like to read studies. Well, and I, I like the fact actually with the just doing, you know, like the double blind placebo controlled or sham controlled studies, it opens it up for the people like that because the idea isn't to just help everybody who's already got that leaning and that's already kind of right at the cutting edge there. The idea is to try and help everybody, yeah. right? You, you don't want to just go, uh, forget you guys, you know, yeah, like, yeah. sorry, 80% of the populace. <laughs> yeah, you need proof. <laughs> 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 Good luck out there. <laughs> All right, you guys, thanks again. Absolutely. Thank man. you. Mm-hmm. 